All right, so Town asked me just before we take our break and bef um, after we come back from break, we're going to really dive in and have some very detailed examples about the types of information. So you just saw uh, some description of the types of things that can be in species descriptions for plants, right? So we're talking about vegetative parts, we're talking about uh, fruiting parts, we're talking about flowers. And so we're gonna provide some very detailed examples of the types of pieces of information that go into these descriptions, right? And the reason that we're doing this, just to reiterate this point before we take a break, is that in order for the name to be available, not only does it have to appear in a publication, as you saw, meet the criteria for a name and be indicated as a new name. And you just saw that's the same in the botanical literature as it is in the zoological literature, right? And specifying types as well as the institution it's in, right? So all of those points were just reiterated um, with the discussion of the botanical literature. But what we're gonna spend the rest of the morning on and maybe into the afternoon or the field site um, is about diagnosis and about really talking about the specific traits and how do we most importantly limit our universe so that we're not comparing the species to every single known species of animal or plant, right? You don't want to have to write a description where you're listing tens of thousands of things that is different from, right? So we're going to talk about strategies for narrowing that universe down to a set of species that are then the ones that we use for comparison in the same genus or in you know, the same region or things like that. Uh, and so this diagnosis is really fundamentally important and I just want to point to you that this is just from yesterday. Um, this piece of the code, let's see where it is, is this article here. So after 1930, right, remember we talked about before 1930 and then after 1930 and then after 1999, Going through time, the code becomes more and more rigorous. And so there's definitely a lot of older names that don't have a diagnosis, right? They appear in the literature, they're used, and they really the authors don't provide any substantive information about how you might tell that species apart from any other species. This confounds us all the time. Um, you know, when you work on little brown things, regardless if they're animals or plants, there tend to be species descriptions that simply say, it is a small brown frog. Not very helpful, right? So when you're trying to identify it in the field and you go back to that paper and that's more or less all it says, that's not useful to you, right? So the reason that you're writing these diagnoses is not just simply to make it available by the code, but fundamentally it's so that, you know, when Caleb shows up and he wants to try and identify what this small brown frog is, he can go through not only the diagnosis that makes it available, but also the description that really characterizes what it looks like, as well as the set of traits that are used to tell it apart from this species and this species and this species and this species, right? And if we don't provide that information, we might meet the code as far as having an available name, but we're really not doing a very good job as far as science, right? We're not actually really providing the information that's gonna move the field forward in, in the future. And that's the type of thing that at least I think all of us believe in as a really important part of doing species descriptions, not just simply to name them, but really to help move the systematics and taxonomy of those groups forward through time. And so in the code, just to make clear, you know, this is for the zoological code, the requirement is it has to be accompanied by a description or a definition, all right? That's one part, but then the second part is the important part, and that's what we're gonna spend time on today. That states in words, so it can't be a picture, which is significant, because sometimes this happens, where there's just simply an image, but just having an image does not itself mean that it's different, right? Um, that states in words, the characters, so specific features of the biology of that animal, that are purported to differentiate the taxon. Now, note here that it says purported. That means supposedly, right? It doesn't mean that those are the best characters in the world. It just means that according to that author, those are the characters, right? Because you can always imagine a situation when Rafe writes a diagnosis and says, well, this is how you tell these frogs apart. And then I come to it and say, that's not a useful feature of the animal. Doesn't matter, right? Because Rafe wrote it in words that gave a list of characters that differentiated it according to him, from this species, from that species, that's it, right? It could be completely wrong, it doesn't matter. So what we're going to spend um, the rest of the morning on is about writing this description about differentiating taxa. What are the pieces of information 
that we use, how do we narrow the universe down from many species for our comparisons to some manageable subset of species that we can ourselves handle in a publication by either using our specimens we've collected in the field or the literature based on you know, the resources we shared with you yesterday. So that's one. The second is, you know, what are the types of characters that for different groups of organisms are important, right? The code says nothing about the characters, just simply that they have to exist, right? So clearly, you know, when we talk about frogs, we don't talk about feathers, right? When we talk about burrowing snakes, we don't talk about the call that they make, right? It makes sense because, you know, that's not relevant to their biology. So as much as possible, what we have is each field has sort of a, a standard in a way, and so it can be quite rich actually, about the types of information that are woven together to really characterize the biology of that new species. And keep in mind that that's really what you're doing. You're not just simply giving a small list of characters that differentiates it from this other species. You're really talking about its biology, right? What's it look like? What does it do? Uh, we have a group of frog species that we're working on right now that are really extremely difficult to tell apart. Uh, these are frogs that we might catch in ponds if we're lucky, the, the genus Xenopus. They more or less all look the same. I can even show you statistically that they look the same. But we can tell them apart genetically, we can tell them apart by their calls, and we can even tell them apart by their parasites, right? The parasites can tell the species apart more easily than we can, right? Because it's really to their biology. Right? They may look all the same to frog scientists, but parasites have absolutely no problem differentiating them. Right? So those are actually all useful characters. Right? Even the parasites that infect these animals differently is one piece of information that's a character for diagnosing them. And so when we talk about characters, we really mean it in this very broad sense. In each field, and you'll see examples from town for birds, from me from frogs, and for Ray for uh, lizards, really has a rich diversity of types of characters that are used for beginning to differentiate between species. And sometimes, to be honest, as you work in a group, you may discover your own set of characters that you find useful, right? That no one's really worked on this genus before, and as soon as you spend time really concentrated on studying those species, you realize, oh, look at this. There's actually this whole set of traits that no one's ever done before, you know? I mean, imagine, uh, in lizards, for instance, we count patterns of scales, right? Imagine suddenly starting to use scale counts on the hand where no one had ever used it before. At some point, there was a scientist that started doing that, right? And so just as you start doing these in-depth studies of groups of organisms, you may find your own set of characters that are useful too. And that's, that's completely fine. Um, and then uh, that's about it, just for a reminder before the break. Just to, just to prime you and make you think about you know, where we're gonna go when we come back from break. And I think that'll be, that'll be good for now, right? Cool, all right.